Wayne Blake is a graduate of Freed Harmon University back in 1992 and is also a graduate of Spring Bible Institute in 98. He preached full time for some 12 years and part time around 26 years. He's preached in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee. He's worked with youth camps in Texas and Louisiana, spoken on lectureships in Texas, Tennessee, Louisiana, and Florida. He's married to his wife, Laura, and they have one daughter, Jenna. They're with us tonight. We're grateful they can be here. Currently, he's attending the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, Texas. The Spring Congregation and Fish Hatchery Road have a wonderful relationship, and that's because we're of the same mind and the same judgment when it comes to matters pertaining to salvation and godly living. And we're thankful to have Wayne with us. We're thankful for his, his family and his life and service to God. He's going to be speaking to us on the subject of the fatal error on Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20. Brother Wayne, come speak to us, please. It's always a pleasure to be able to come here and to speak and to be here with the brethren. To see you again. I was trying to look at that clock. I can't even hardly see that clock. So I know I got four extra minutes. So I don't know. We're going to try to remember. We'll see what time it is when we're done here. I figured that was coming. We have great news at our house. Uh, many of you uh, have been praying for my wife and uh, know about her surgery. And I just want to kind of give a quick update. As of yesterday, about 1030, my wife has almost normal hearing in that ear after having the thing put in. Now, I say that, you talk into that ear, she's not going to understand what you're saying. So understand, it's a process, but a six-month to a year process of trying to reteach the brain to distinguish what a no what type of noise is that she's listening to. But um, that was pretty cool. And she's got a network that is set up on her head now. Boy, I tell you. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, everything. <laughs> but uh, continue to pray for her as she goes through this. It's not going to be an easy process. It's going to take a little time. Uh, she'll struggle with it. It's not going to be perfect. But... Uh, she came through the surgery just fine, which I knew she would. She was worried. I don't know why. Surgery. Just going to drill a hole in your head. What's the big deal? But uh, we're thankful for all that. I, uh, I was scared to death that last sermon. Uh, you know, which they're putting two sermons about baptism back to back. That kind of, you know, you're going to stomp all over each other. But when you got to Mark 16, I thought, man, all I'm going to be able to do is give an invitation and we'll be through. <laughs> so that's to your benefit. No. But I want to uh, go over some things tonight. Fatal error regarding baptism, in particular, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20. You know, we look around our world today and it never fails. Most denominations agree on some type of repentance, some type of faith, some type of confession. But where we begin to make a lot of differing roads is when it comes to baptism. Some will say you're saved before baptism. Some will say you're saved only by Holy Spirit baptism. Some will say this. Some will say a lot of things. But as was pointed out last hour, what we're concerned about is what does the Bible say regarding these things? Not what a person says or thinks or any other kind of thing. You know, baptism itself is defined as to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. But they define, sadly, in our world, to sprinkle, pour, or immerse. Uh, no, uh, we come to... Uh, the truth regarding this, trying to understand exactly what the Bible says, because sadly in our world, a lot of people follow what their clergy, and I use that term uh, very widely there, uh, what their clergy tell them what to do. What do I need to do to be saved? Well, the clergy will tell them, and they basically follow that, whatever they tell them to do. Uh, not what the Bible says. 
They believe in different modes, as we've talked about. Uh, many believe that it's optional. Some believe it's required. Basically, it's whatever your denominational group teaches regarding that subject, that's, what the, that's basically what you're supposed to do. In researching this, I, you know, it's interesting that uh, things you wanted to put in the manuscript, they don't come until after you've already sent the manuscript off. So I'm going to offer some newer information to this, but I uh, have been perusing the internet, looking up different things and trying to find things people say on this. And it seems to me the millennials, which that's people that were born in the year 2000, question was posed to them. Uh, a lot of questions, but I'm only dealing with three. One question was, do you believe that Jesus is God? And they said, true. They believe that. They asked the question, do you believe that Jesus sinned? And they said, that's false. They believe that Jesus did not sin. In other words, that he lived a sinless life. The third question is the one that troubles me more than any. And it's nothing new. It's nothing going to startle you. It's not going to cause you to take a breath. But it's just the question was asked. Jesus is one of many ways to heaven. And they said true. That's millennials. That's people that are under the age of 20. That's where they stand on this. And so we, we look around and, and we see troublesome times are coming to the church. The time that, uh, that where we see our young people are being taught that we are, as a religious people, we're just here to coexist. How you determine to go to heaven is your deal. How you go is your deal. And we're all going to wind up making it there no matter how we do it. And our young people are eating this stuff up. We have, uh, sadly, in the last 20 to 50 years, a mentality where it is wrong to some, tell someone that they're wrong. Political correctness has already been mentioned. We have a lot of other terms we may put on it, but basically what it is is a brainwashing of our society, our culture, into believing that one person can sin and I have no right to say that that's a sin. And we see that happening in our pulpits across the world where people are standing up and basically giving feel-good lessons and not teaching anyone right from wrong. People, religiously speaking, can be lumped into three categories. You got the couch potatoes, which basically, uh, it's a little bit different <clears throat> termination on that, but they adapt to culture by staying silent on tough cultures, cultural questions. And the idea there is, is that neutrality is the norm. I don't want to do anything that's going to rock the boat. I don't want to teach anything that's going to... Uh, make someone feel bad or, or imply that they may be doing something wrong. That's the couch potato. The, third, the second group is the cafeteria style. And you pretty well by that name understand. They pick and choose the things they want to do and the things they don't want to do. They opt for scriptures that basically go along with their cultural idea of how things are going to be. They focus only on the nice things. That's this mentality that teaches basically that the Bible is a love letter. You need to teach on grace. You need to teach on love, the goodness of God. Now, now none of us would teach against any of those things, but that's not all we're supposed to teach on. <clears throat> they refuse to be silent. Um, well, then you have the third group, which is the convictionals group, which they refused to be silent despite the culture. They talked about love and grace while showing needs that people need to turn from sin. And that's basically the three groups of people, if you want to uh, put a broad category out there. But what we see around us is a feel-good doctrine kind of people. They worry about what makes them feel good and well about other people, whether it's biblical or not. They attend churches that leave uh, them feeling good about their life choices, 
even if that conflicts with what the Bible says. They opt for some kind of feel-good, better lifestyle. They contribute to nonprofits that exploit the, the terms of justice and oppression and inequality. Now, all this is going to make a point here in just a minute. I, I know it sounds like I'm going way out here, but I'm, I'm going to bring this around here in just a minute. <clears throat> this is the culture that we have in our world. The type of people that when you meet them on the street, this is where they're coming from. They're redefining terms. To them, equality does not mean what the Bible teaches on equality. To them, justice is not the kind of justice the Bible talks about. Being oppressed means something completely different than what the Bible would teach. So what they do is they tweak the language to make it more neutral, less confrontational, because, you know, we just all want to get along. Just want to get along. We fear about the attitude of being called intolerant or, un or, non or not very compassionate. But instead of standing as a voice against uh, the murdering of children through abortion and all these other kinds of things about marriage and all, people just don't want to rock the boat. You know, that's even happening now within the Lord's church. People are scared to get up and say that homosexual marriage is a sin. And in fact, if you go to Canada, you might get thrown in jail for that. It won't be long. It won't be long. So this idea of instead of, of being that way, they forego the authority of Scripture. They embrace the couch potato or the cafeteria lifestyle in all forms for sake of being tolerant. So what has that got to do with all this, what my sermon is? Well, think about it. You have a person who comes from a denominational background. You're sitting down with them in a Bible study and you're starting to teach them about the authority of the Bible, that the Bible is in black and white, and that's not the color of print, but in deadline, in lines and how God has drawn how he wants things done. And the only authority we have is what God says. And in the realm of baptism, we have the same problem. What do I need to do to be saved? Well, you know, I don't really, I don't want to teach something that might cause you to think that I don't love you. I don't want to teach something that might make you feel bad. So what do I do? Well, you have to work that out on your own. In Mark 16, yeah, verse 15, <clears throat> verse 16, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. Boy, those are pretty harsh words, aren't they? That's pretty unloving, is it not? A lot of people say yes. So what do we do? Let's throw it out of the Bible. Let's just act like it's not there. You say you were saved by, by praying to God and you felt a feeling in your heart and therefore you're saved. Well, then by all means, that's fine. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. We don't want to be harsh. We don't want to be unloving. In the Mark's account of the Great Commission, Jesus' words are clear and very simple. And so what we want to do now is begin to look at, I broke it down into basically four categories of, five categories of people, their teachings, their ideas of, about baptism. Verse 15 and 16, it is very clear that Jesus wanted the gospel proclaimed to everyone as well as a parallel verse to that is chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. That's what the Bible says. What we find 
are basically five different diverse groups that teach varying ideas about baptism. The first one being, he who believes and is baptized will not be saved. That's kind of a little different. When my wife read that, she said, is that what you're really, you know, we had a little discussion about that. And as she was going over my manuscript, if I didn't have her go over my manuscript, I would be scared what Brother David would say about my manuscript. I can write just as well as I speak. And to an English teacher, my wife just grits her teeth. I can write a paragraph in one sentence. And it'll be five pages long. It's one paragraph. She gets, she gets a kick out of that. I just think it sounds normal to me. There are actually those who have this idea that believe, a person can believe and be baptized, but you're not going to be saved. You think about groups that, like the atheists, the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus, they believe in a God or gods, but they don't believe in hell or salvation of any kind. A lot of people believe that this world, that's all there is to it. I live and I die, and that's it. Some believe they come back as a slug, or they come back as something else, I don't know. But the point is, all you have is what's in this life, that's it. Many of them don't believe that salvation is found in Jesus. Many of them will say Jesus is a good man. He was a prophet. He was a lot of things. But they will not do what, God commanded, what Jesus commands to be done. You have a second group that says, He who does not believe and is not baptized will be saved. This is a hurt held by people that we call universalists. You know, they believe eventually God is going to save everybody. No one's going to be lost. They isolate passages of scriptures to the exclusion of others because they have to. You see, that's this cafeteria attitude. It's just pick and choose what goes along with what we believe. The Bible teaches very plainly in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, that Jesus says, if you don't do what I tell you to do, you're going to be lost. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. We are warned about those who will not be saved will face the wrath of God in Ephesians 5. Many who profess to be Christians today would not profess either one of these views, but they will profess this third one. And that is, he who does not believe and is baptized shall be saved. This was talked about pretty extensively, so we're not going to talk a lot about it, but this is getting into the realm of infant baptism. An infant can't believe anything. In fact, if you've ever been around a child, they, I tell you, I love babies. I love the way they smell. I love the kind of life they have. I mean, they get to kick back, relax, and everybody take care of them. Well, what kind of better life is that? Not a care in the world. They can cry, and we're going to turn the world upside down trying to figure out how to keep them from crying. We've got to stop that crying. We want them to be happy. But there is not one baby that I have ever seen nor heard of that can understand biblical faith. Ask a one-year-old what biblical faith is, and... Uh, you might get something back from them. Probably just a puzzled look. Therefore, they can't be candidates for baptism. Some try to get around this by saying that God imparts saving faith to the infant so baptism can still save them. You see, if I, if I can't get there directly, then I'm going to figure out a way to get around it. And then if you start doing that, you can get anywhere you want to. What parent would love to be able to take a child's pain away from the very moment that they are hurt? I've heard parents say, I've even said that myself, I wish it was me that was sick, not her. You just don't like seeing our children hurt, sick. 
those kinds of things. But what do we learn? A child has to endure those things. No matter how bad I want to take it away from them, take that pain, that suffering away from them, they have to endure it. And this view of this uh, teaching uh, that infants are to be baptized clearly contradicts, contradicts the Bible. Faith is necessary for salvation as well as baptism. Acts chapter 8, verse 35, as well as in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. Sprinkling and pouring is not a Bible baptism. Not until the 5th century, 5th century, 400 years about approximately, after the institution of baptism was sprinkling and pouring added as a mode of baptism. Most who hold this view are honest and sincere. There's no doubt in my mind. I've met a lot of honest and sincere people that are honest and sincerely wrong. But you see, where we live today, you've got to be careful how you say that because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. The fourth group, are those who say, he who believes and is not baptized will be saved. Most denominations today believe that. And sadly, some within the Lord's church. This is because of the faith-only doctrine that's being taught and taken on by many people in our world. Many believe that they are saved before baptism. Therefore, baptism is not essential for salvation. All I have to do is believe, have my heart right, feel right about myself, feel right about my relationship to God, and I'm saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. Think about this doctrine. What it in essence teaches is one can be saved without their sins ever being washed away. They're saved in their sin. The fifth group are those who believe and are baptized, will be saved. This view takes Jesus at his word. Jesus says, he that believes that is baptized shall be saved. I'll take Jesus at his word and know that I am doing what God wants me to do. I do not need to explain anything. No explanations are needed. Just take Jesus at his word. This is what he said to do then just do what he said to do. But you know, we talk about baptism. Baptism is only by immersion. And I know we look around our world today, as we already alluded to, there are a lot of people today that believe that you can sprinkle or pour or do a lot of things and still call it baptism. But Paul said in Ephesians 4 and verse 5 that there is one baptism. Now Paul should know because he also told us in other places this very thing. He describes what that one baptism is. Romans 6 verse 3 and following says, Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up on the, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we then have been planned together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. The one baptism described by Paul is that about only a burial. That's the baptism that he's talking about here. If I decided one day to kill my neighbor, this is purely hypothetical. Now, as a side note, I will say, if you don't know, my parents are one of my neighbors. I'm not talking about them. <laughs> That's in case he's watching, you know. I'm talking about uh, the other neighbor. And let's say I get out there and I cause him harm. I take his life. I murder him. Somewhere along the investigation that takes about 44 minutes, what's TV? It just takes 44 minutes. They solve the crime. 
police officer gets me and talks to me and asks me, what happened to your neighbor? And I tell him I buried him. Well, why did you bury him? That's just what you do. You know, I say, well, I buried him right behind the tree in the backyard. Now, if I had the same mentality about people with baptism as I do with burying, then what I can basically say is I buried him, but all I did was sprinkle a little dirt on top of it. That's not burying. Some may say, well, you know, I just poured a little bit of dirt on him. That's not burying. Burying is digging a hole, putting them in it, and filling that hole up with dirt to where you don't see that body anymore. That's a burial. That's a burial. I buried that body. I didn't just leave it out there. You see, but Paul goes on to talk about this type of baptism. In Colossians 2 and verse 12, it says, buried with him in baptism. He go, he's already told us in Romans. Now he tells us again in Colossians. He defines what baptism is. It's a burial. It's a burial. He goes on to tell us that God saves us by baptism. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How did God save us? He says, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Through baptism, God saved us. And Peter, another apostle, an inspired writer backs Paul up by saying the very same thing, but in a different way. 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21. When sometime we're disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure wherein to even baptism does now also save us, not the putting of the way of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, recounting his conversion, his obedience to the gospel, he says, he was told, and now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized, wash away your sins. Now let's go back to what people can say about baptism. Some believe they're baptized before they ever hit the water. Some believe they're saved through prayer. Some believe they're saved a lot of ways. But the Bible says you're only saved by burial in water. And you're saved by God. That's why our sins are washed away. The list goes on and on as far as using different points all through the New Testament in dealing with this very idea. But the point that we're making about this is simply this. Our sins can only be washed away by baptism. We are only baptized when we are immersed or buried. Immersion is a burial. And that burial is what saves us. Doing it the way God commanded to be done. Listening to the words of Jesus. Now I know a lot of people say, yeah, but you know, that's not what my preacher says. Well, you know, my parents, they didn't teach me that. The denomination that I'm a part of taught me that this is what I need to do to be saved. Some may even say, well, you know, I thought... But listen to what Jesus says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We must be willing to listen to Jesus, not 
our fellow man. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 8, he says, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And the idea there is, is that if we look out in our world today and its various teachings on what baptism is, those are doctrines of men. And it doesn't matter what church you're a part of. If you don't follow what the Bible says and how to be saved, you are not my brother or sister in Christ. Now, I know our culture says that's not a good thing to say. Now, you're going to upset some people. But I want to take Jesus at his word. I want to take God at his word. Why? Because they're the one that came up with the plan. They're the ones that told us how to be saved. And if I'm going to truly be saved the way God, and, and all that, that means, then I'm going to do what God said to do. John reminds us that we must listen to Jesus or we're going to be lost. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning of verse 3, it says, And thereby we do know that we know him. How do you know Jesus? If we keep his commandments. Jesus told us what to do to be saved. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's pretty harsh. But those are the words that come to us through the Holy Spirit. You do things God's way, or you cannot, and if you profess that you love God, if you love Jesus Christ, then you're a liar. You're a liar. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him, and he that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk, even as he walked. You know, all of us have life decisions to make. All of us have decisions we have to make as to where we're going to spend eternity. Are we going to do things our way and just kind of let things go as they are? Or are we going to do things the way God wants them done? You know, we have decisions to make every day in our life. And one of them is, what do I need to do to be saved? Well, the Bible is very clear. And it's up to me to decide if I'm going to do it the way God says or not. We go on to read in Mark chapter 16. Verse 17, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take up servants, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. And confirming the word with signs following. Signs will follow them that believe. The apostles were given the great commission to go out and to preach the gospel. To teach people the word of God and therefore by teaching them the gospel, eventually they would be baptized and be saved. They would believe the things were being taught. Now the apostles had the ability and you know, um, I'm, I tried in my manuscript not to get on anybody's anything that they're speaking on. And that's what I'm going to try to do as I go through this very quickly. But as the apostles were able to perform miracles to confirm the word of God, as that's what miracles were for, people believed on what they spoke. And here we have Jesus teaching that those who believe on you will now have the ability to also perform miracles. Now in my other lesson in Acts chapter 8, we know that those miracles were given by the laying on the hands of the apostles. But for to stay out of that, to stay where we're at, we're just going to keep going. But the idea there was is that they were able to give, impart gifts to people. And then they were promised certain things from those gifts. 
in his name that will cast out devils. They will be given the opportunity, the ability to take care of things that the people would be involved in. Sin, activities, Satan taking residence of people. People were possessed of devils. Philip, Peter, and Paul cast out de demons and unclean spirits with, a, with complete success, with no failures. They'd be able to speak tongues, new tongues. And the idea there is, just like on the day of Pentecost, they'd be given the ability to speak a language that they had never formally or informally learned. They'd be able to speak to the people that they were in the presence of. They'd be able to take up serpents. The only recorded example of this is when Paul was bitten by a snake. And as you know, he was bitten and he just went right on. And it was amazing to the people because this was a very poisonous snake. And yet, he had no repercussions from being bitten. They would be able to drink anything deadly without harm. We don't have any examples in the New Testament of anybody doing this, but Jesus said they'll be able to. Therefore, I believe that people were able to do that very thing because Jesus said so. Be able to lay hands and heal the sick. Just like the apostles, they would be given the ability to confirm the things they had been saying by helping those who needed the help. And so as we decide tonight, at this moment, we need to ask ourselves, are we going to follow what the Bible says? Or are we going to follow the commandments of men? There is no better time than now to obey the gospel. Over in Acts chapter 2, very quickly, we see there recorded Peter and the eleven stand before that group of people, began to profess unto them about Jesus. They reminded them that this same Jesus whom you have crucified is both Lord and Savior. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, it says that they heard the things that, they were, that were said, and it says they stopped them, and they asked them, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, there's some things we can learn from this. Those people were given a message. It's obvious that some of them believed it because of the response that they had toward that message. What should I do? And what were they told to do? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Tonight there may be one here that finds themselves in a situation where somewhere along the line where they were raised in a home where their parents taught them what their parents believed. And you take the Bible and you begin to read just a short part of what we did tonight and what others will do over these next few days. And you'll begin to read this and you'll ask yourself a question. Did I do what this says to do? If you come from the denomination, I will tell you right now, your denomination does not teach what the Bible teaches regarding this. You have to do what God says to do. And so we offer the opportunity for someone who is not a Christian, someone who has not obeyed the gospel. We offer an opportunity for that person to do things the way God said to do them, the way Jesus commanded to be done. I remember one time I was in a Bible study with a person and it it's quickly got out of hand. And what I mean by that is every time we get to a hard passage in her mind, uh, the first thing out of her mind was, I need to go back and ask my priest. I was new to that. I, I just kind of, okay, whatever you need to do. And in time, she finally did become a Christian. But it took a lot of work. And the reason I say that is for this very reason. There are a lot of people out there that have been programmed to believe exactly what the priest or preacher or whoever it is teaches on this subject. And so it's not going to be easy for a lot to just be able to read from this and, okay, I want to be a Christian, I want to be baptized. No, there's going to be a lot of unteaching. A lot of things are going to have to be done. But they will eventually.